You know, yesterday I was looking again at the, uh, the chart of the sects among the Sedevacantists. It's pretty bad on our side already, but it's a lot worse on their side. They are a lot more divided into many other subsects, and they are tremendously scattered. The, the, the way they are scattered, the, the chaos which reigns among them is, uh, is ultimate. So we must not join that, the, a similar chaos. It's very hard for us. We are called the Marin Corps of St. Pius X. We remain, until our last breath, the, the children, the sons of St. Pius X. Dear friends, there is no better way to attract God's anger than to lack the virtue of charity. That's the gospel of today. You know, there is the minor servant. He is forgiven talents of money. One talent was a bar of gold, basically, if you want to know. He was forgiven by his master. And then uh, he, he was owed only 50 pieces of silver, and he refuses to forgive. And so our Lord says the master was very angry. Likewise, we know very well, go to hell, you curse into everlasting fire because I was hungry and you did not give me to eat and so on and so forth. You did not fulfill my law of charity. So the lack of charity is what uh, causes the flames of the divine wrath. Charity is the highest virtue, and we cannot make the economy of that virtue. If you are lacking some other virtue, you are struggling to get out of sin from some other virtues. But if you have charity, eventually your charity will crank you out of the mire. Certainly. Because it's the queen of all the other virtues, and all the other virtues work for the boss. The boss of all virtues is charity. Like the boss of all sacraments is the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of charity. And the boss of all the gifts of the Holy Ghost is wisdom or divine love among all the other gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now, we see today uh, the, the punishment for those who do not have divine charity. Those poor Semites, you know. One is the son of uh, Isaac, the Jews. One is the son of Ishmael, the Arabs, and they are at each other. You know. That's the curse of not having uh, charity. Because without divine grace, how can you forgive atrocities that the other one has, has, has committed? It's out of the question. There, there can be no conclusion to the fight. I, was, I remember, you know, 20 years ago, I was in the Dubai airport, and I met a Palestinian and he told me, Father, this is war forever. I was a little child. I was playing in my village. The bus arrived, and then they put us all into the bus. We were not even allowed to go back to our homes to pick up our belongings. Father, this is war forever. It's horrible. It's the kingdom of Satan. And so it's the same for us Catholics. You know, the, in the dangerous times, of Pope Francis, the, uh, this tremendous crisis of the church will have to be solved by uh, the virtue of faith, indeed. No unity of the church, no charity possible without the faith, but not without the help of uh, charity. And uh, Archbishop Vigano was raising the question of, of uh, universal acceptance of Francis saying that it's not an argument because of the Great Schism. I would say, on the contrary, during the Great Schism, uh, Urban uh, VI was elected twice 
during the election, which was movemented, but it was confirmed twice in the conclave that he was elected. Then after his election, he was proclaimed. Then the cardinal signed affidavits that there was no duress. And then for four months, there was no challenge to his election. And so the whole of Europe, all the courts of Europe, were able to recognize, universally accept Urban VI as Pope. And that's why all historians say that he is the authentic Pope. Later on, another Pope, Clement VII, is going to spring up, so you're going to have two lines of papacy. And then when the cardinals on both sides are going to be fed up with the schism and the refusal of the two to give up their, uh, their papacy, the cardinals are going to flee from both sides. They're going to assemble in the council of Pisa, you know, the Leaning Tower, and they're going to elect another pope. And then you're going to have three lines of popes running parallel with each other. And that was very grave at the time because these popes had money, they had soldiers, they had armies, and they wanted to fight. And so they, you had battles, lots of people were dying, and Christianity was torn apart. And the devil was having a great time in tearing the church apart. You know. So if the Great Schism is an indication, uh, that's one thing. That, yes, universal acceptance should have been recognized from day one, and there would have never been a Great Schism. That's one thing. But the solution to that Great Schism was precisely the charity of Pope Benedict, the, no, no, Gregory XII, the, the successor of Urban VI, the one that was legitimate in the first place. He accepted, he said, we have to fix this mess. I abandon the papacy, I renounce the papacy. Uh, for a grave reason, not for a fake reason like Benedict XVI renounced, but for the real reason. We need to stop that schism. And so he, he laid down his papacy, he, he renounced it, uh, on condition that the others would also renounce. And then he called the council, so that is, he empowered the Council of Constance to assemble, and it was a success. 50 cardinals, 80 archbishops, 500 bishops, uh, almost a million people came there with all the retinues, all these things. And they were able to solve the schism. And it was also the charity of the emperor, not just of the actual pope, but also the emperor, the emperor Sigismund. Sigismund was very charitable and did all he could to solve the schism. So when uh, the, the Pisa line pope renounced the papacy, the emperor knelt down and kissed the feet of the one who renounced, the second one who renounced the papacy. And then the last one, the successor of Clement VII, you know, the third branch, refused. But even there, Sigismund, the emperor of Germany, traveled all the way down to Spain in order to talk to Pedro de Luna or Benedict XIII, the last one who didn't want to back down. And he went to talk to him very patiently, very charitably, and it is his charity that did not open the eyes of Benedict XIII or Pedro de Luna, was very obdurate in schism, but the other cardinals, the other Spanish bishops, the uh, southern French clergy and so forth, opened their eyes. And then they resolved to unite with the, uh, the rest of Christendom in the Council of Constance. And they were able to elect one pope, Pope Martin V. And so the, the Great Schism uh, found a, a solution. <coughs> and so I think we are heading that way. It is not just by ourselves clearing that the schism, that the, uh, the, 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 the de facto schism, the conciliar church is a schismatic church because it's heretical. If you are heretical, you are implicitly a schismatic. Whereas... Not all schismatics are heretics, necessarily. But the, the conciliar church is really something uh, schismatic in nature. And then we can thank, in a way, Francis for making things so clear. Because just now, just this month, we have two more priests joining the resistance in Sydney. 
One of them has been ordained by uh, Bishop Williamson. Because Francis makes things so clear by his lack of charity, then he forces those priests who were ecclesiastical, they were hoping that they could be traditional within the confines of the diocese. And since the Bishop of Sydney refuses to ordain him, then they probably knocked at the SSPX. The SSPX refuses to fight the diocese. That's well known. And so they want to see Bishop Williamson. And so they are bailing us out in Australia because we don't have enough priests in Australia. And so, in a way, Francis can continue his game because what Francis is doing is that he is uh, coalescing, he is doing the, the proper mitosis. You see, when a soul divides, the two chromosomes line, line up facing each other. They face each other for some time and then the, the cell split. So what we see is, is the chromosomes are lining up they are lining up. The, novus, the people who don't want to be Catholic, Catholics anymore, those hardened Novus Ordo, and on the other side, those who are more traditional, but who are still entangled in the Novus Ordo Church, but they are moving away from the uh, official church. And so we see the chromosome lining up. And that was not happening under Benedict. It's happening now under Francis. Those who really have the faith are obliged to stand. And then eventually they have to come back to our position that no collaboration can be made with heretics. Heresy needs to be denounced. Francis needs to be called a heretic and we need to separate from him. But when, the, when is the cell going to split? That we don't know. It's very complicated. If you do it too early, you are leaving too many traditional-minded people within the conciliar church. If you do it too late, then uh, they are all dead. They lose the faith and they, uh, they lose their souls. So it's, it's God's decision. Yeah. And, and usually God's decision is with the help of a civil prince, a temporal power. In the time of the Great Schism, it was Emperor Sigismund. He was the Holy Roman Emperor of that time. And he's, he truly saved the church. It's there that we see that the lay sword has a role to play at times. So he truly saved the church. Who is going to save the church now? Who is going to stand for the natural order at least? Who is going to convert eventually and be the light of the nations for our times? Which nation is going to be possibly the fourth Holy Roman Empire, whose kings in the past also bore the title of Caesar? What is that nation that our lady has indicated? Yeah. So we must be confident. We must be confident that a, a charity will prevail and that God is going to help the church. And so, um, among uh, our circles, we've, we've always advocated that the question of the holding of the office is very complicated. It was very complicated in the time of the Great Schism. Even in those, in those times, it says, you cannot judge the Pope uh, because uh, he's not a heretic. And so they had to declare, to stretch it, make him a heretic to to say that they were judging him, but they were not judging him in fact. They were simply declaring him for what he was, you know. But that there, there, you needed to have, to solve the schism, you needed to have quite a number of prelates, a sufficient number of prelates. Now it's true in the resistance we're a bit top heavy. We've got seven bishops, 110 priests. So the ship is a bit top-heavy. It's like those Japanese uh, warships, one of them you know, capsized because he had too many weapons on the top. So we're a bit top-heavy, but even seven bishops are not enough. That's not enough just even to declare 
Francis a heretic. Now, we are entitled, all of us, we are entitled to declare and to declare publicly that Francis is a heretic. Yes. We, we, we have to call a spade a spade. And because the faith is the life of the soul, we are obliged to profess the faith. That we are obliged. But the question of the holding of the office is a lot more complicated. It was a big mess in the time of the Great Schism. And then the, the theologians around the Great Schism could not agree with each other. And then they, they, they led to the dangerous era of conciliarism. And, uh, and then you had the opposite error, which was ultramontanism. That is today's exaggeration of the prerogatives of the Sea of Peter. That uh, the Pope must be followed, even if he is a heretic the abuse which is going on today. So you got these two big errors. So it's very hard to strike the correct line. And um, the solution of the crisis of the church, I'm convinced, is miraculous. It's miraculous just like the solution of the great schism was miraculous. It is not in our power to solve that immense state of desolation in which the Catholic Church is. What is in our power is to, is to grow, is to be more Catholic ourselves, to make little uh, flames, little uh, citadels of prayer and the practice of the faith. That's in our power. But to, to solve the, the great picture, no. We have a role that way, but it is not just us. It, there, are, there are much larger forces at stake involved in that, uh, in that solution to the crisis of the church. So um, continue to, um, to struggle, not just for the virtue of faith, but for the virtue of charity. And then you can see, you know, yesterday I was looking again at the, uh, the chart of the sects among the Sedevacantists. It's pretty bad on our side already. But it's a lot worse on their side. They are a lot more divided into many other subsects. And they are tremendously scattered. The, the, the way they are scattered, the, the chaos which reigns among them is, uh, is ultimate. So we must not join that, the, a similar chaos. It's very hard for us. It's really hard for us to keep the, 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 the bond of charity in our times. Because we don't, we, don't, we don't have a working papacy. We don't have anyone to solve our disputes. When there is a dispute, there is no one to put an end to it and, and decide something. And so when something wrong is done to us, when someone attacks us, uh, it's, uh, the, the only solution we have is to endure, to endure uh, what is uh, done to us, to forgive, to forgive the sins committed against us, as our Lord is advising us in his parable in the gospel of today. There is no other solution. We cannot solve the crisis in the way that we wish to. But at the same time, we see that if we keep charity, God blesses and God provides a great increase. So we have more and more missions, more and more groups uh, uh, attending the Mass in the Philippines, and more vocations on the way. I've got four vocations that need to come on top of the two that I have from Australia, and then there are two or three Indian vocations. Now these four and those three Indians have a difficulty to come here in the Philippines. But it seems that God is providing. doesn't mean that we are charitable, but we can only be grateful to God to give us what resembles a little bit uh, a reward of some level of charity that we've been able to achieve. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.